نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه فقال عز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال عز وجل الحاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علما يقين لترون الجحيم ثم لترونها عينا يقين ثم لتسألن يومئذ عن النعيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي. اللهم ارنا أرن اللهم ارنا اشياء كما هي. اللهم ارنا اشياء حقيقة الاشياء. اللهم امين يا رب العالمين، اللهم صل على محمد. I just recited to you uh, from Surah Al Kathur. And before I start going into the meaning of this particular surah, a few things, a few points that you want to keep in mind. I'm going to use a philosophical term not just to make things difficult, but to, for the people that have an understanding of the subject, they will be able to appreciate it because it's also being recorded. This surah is a very important surah in regards to Islamic epistemology. I will share with you what I mean. There are different levels of knowing something. I'll give you an example. I know the North Pole exists, but I have never been to the North Pole. But I know it exists because I read about it, because everyone says it exists, because everyone says it exists, and I read about it, and I'm pretty sure from what I see in the documentaries, what is documented, that it, North Pole really does exist. But my knowing that the North Pole exists is different from the person who has or who deals with the photographic pictures from the satellites of the North Pole. So he actually sees the North Pole. Or somebody who flew over the North Pole. I know North Pole exists. He also knows the North Pole exists. And his experience of knowing the North Pole exists is different from the person who lives in the North Pole. If a person's living in North Pole, then obviously his understanding of what is North Pole is very different from the person who takes the pictures, which is very different from the person who is pretty sure probably the North Pole does exist. These are three levels of knowing something. First one is called Ilmul Yaqeen. الحاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين. You're very sure based upon knowledge that the North Pole exists. But the higher level of knowing is عين اليقين. كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لا ترون الجاهين ثم لا ترونها عين اليقين. When you 
finally actually see the hellfire, then your level of knowledge of the existence of the hellfire will be Ainul in you. So one is to know the North Pole exists. One is to have been over the North Pole, to have seen the North Pole. And one is to actually live in the North Pole. This is in Quran in another place. So Ilmun Yaqeen and Ainun Yaqeen are in this surah. The terms, they're in this surah. But Haqqul Yaqeen is in another surah. I believe it's Surah Al-Fussilat. Salurihim ayatina. Allah says, We will show them our signs. Fil afaq in the horizons. Wa fi anfusihim. And in themselves. Hatta until we'll keep making things clear. This Quran is from Allah. Time will show. Salurihim. Soon we will show them. Ayatina, our signs. Fil afaq in the horizons. Wa fi anfusihim. And in themselves. Hatta yatabayyana anna ul haq. Until it is absolutely clear this is haq. Meaning that there will be, it's more than ilmun yaqeen, it is more than ainun yaqeen, according to Quran, that the ayat Allah will show, or the ayat that Allah has been showing in the Quran, they're haqqul yaqeen. It is as if you have visited Islam, or you have lived in the North Pole. After men, while the surah mentions these three, two levels of knowing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this different levels of knowing for the purpose that is before it, what proceeds before it. And inshallah I will be talking about that. But just a side point about this third level of knowledge, which I read the ayah, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ you know, there was no such thing as a subject as Qur'an and science. It didn't exist prior to the modern time. <coughs> and uh, Morris Bukhari wrote the first book on Qur'an, science, and the Bible, in which he compared the Qur'an with the Bible, and the Qur'an with science, and the Bible with science, and it became a very popular book in its time. And uh, he wrote other books that were also very interesting, but they didn't get as popular. But the things that are mentioned in Qur'an, for example, the expanding universe, the Big Bang Theory, the, the, the clinging of the baby, the clinging of the placenta, which is basically Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq, Khalaq Al-Insana Min Alaq. You also know the word in Urdu, Mu'allaq Huna, Mu'allaq, right? The, 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 to be hanging, basically. The placenta hangs in the womb of the mother. So, uh, the, the spaces of the embryological stage, as described in Quran, properly based upon as human observation would see it. Uh, which is an essential part, because uh, observation is what Quran holds keenly when it comes to the way the Quran describes things. So anyway, the point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has over time, even talking about black holes, talking about uh, the, uh, the, the stars that have died, so on and so forth. The inevitable death of this universe, also mentioned in the Quran. So these things are very clear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now coming to this surah, by the way, I want to mention one thing about this surah to understand and to maybe appreciate this chapter of the Quran. Keep in mind, after the surah is the Asr. And the central ayah in the Asr is, Inna al-insana la fi Man is in loss. Everyone's a loser. This is the central theme of the surah. In this surah, the one that we read, Al-Hakum Al-Takathur Hatta Zurtum Al-Maqabir The main theme is knowledge. Kalla Sawfa Ta'lamun The main theme is, you will definitely come to know. You can deny it today. And Allah mentions the reason of your denial, which I will come to in a second. You can deny it today, but tomorrow you will come to know. And the surah before this is Al-Qariya. I, I, I will show you how these three are connected, if I get a chance. But I want to start with now keeping these three forms of knowledge in mind. There is ilmul yaqeen, aynul yaqeen, haqqul yaqeen. Keeping these three things in mind. Now we start with the surah. Alha kumut takathur. Alha, alha, alha. In 
you know, in, in psychology, there's actually a term for this. It's called fixation. Fixation, or you, it, fixation needs sometimes to obsess, obsessive compulsive disorder. You're obsessed with something. You're obsessed. And what happens when you're obsessed with something? Because I want to give you this an understanding of, of understand the spirit of the verse. Someone can have an obsession or a fear. What will be the fear? The fear is that maybe an asteroid, for example, I'm sitting here. It is a possibility, however, minimally, it is a possibility. It is a possibility, however, that while I'm speaking here, that some asteroid from space comes and hits us. It's a possibility. Someone can have this fear. But in general, day to day, we ignore the things and the risks that are so minimal. We ignore the risks that are so minimal that we live our life as if those risks don't exist. We're going to sit here and listen to the khutbah as if no asteroid is coming because with the possibility that an asteroid is coming, you're not necessarily required to be here. But if somebody becomes obsessed, somebody has a fixation that, oh, what if, what if, what if the asteroid comes and hits this place? That obsession, that fixation will cause him to think irrational. That, that obsession will cause him to behave irrationally. This is what Quran is saying. You're so fixated over what? Your desire, your fixation for wanting more and more. The kafir is on the bab of tafa'ul. The kafir, the kafir, the fa'ul. More and more, more and more, more and more. Never enough. Even there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet said that when a man is almost senile, meaning he's old and he's almost senile, he's reached a very old age, the Prophet says two things will still not leave him. Greed and hope. You go to the nursing cares, and you talk to the old people in the nursing care that are at that stage, they're still hoping, still hoping, my, my children, my children, hope. And still wanting more, my assets, my assets, my assets. So the Prophet ﷺ said that when even a person is in an old age, two things don't leave him, greed and hope. And why we want more? Because we have hope. Why we want more? Because greed which, of course, to a certain degree is justifiable. This is not the point. The point of the ayah is that how that fixation causes you to think from a Quranic perspective irrationally. Just like if you believe an asteroid can possibly hit the earth and you don't come to Jum'ah because of that possibility, that is an irrational act. In the same way, to be so engrossed so involved in the life of this world that you are so fixated with more and more and more that the reality of what's coming next, you become blind to it. This Quran says, what is this? You are not able to see, see things for their reality. You're not able to see reality anymore. So the Quran says, Now, because of your desire for more, and then you desire more and then you work. You struggle for more and more and more and more. And this word, takafur, gives the, the idea of the intent of that you are getting more in also competition to other people. Takafur. I don't want to go into how uh, there's other aspects of this word, the kafir, but al hakumut the kafir hatta zurutumul maqabir until you reach your maqabir, until you reach your qabr. Maqabir is the plural. Until you reach your graves, you didn't know what passed you by. You, your whole life can be summarized as one struggle after another struggle. One one target after another target. 
one, one thing after another one. Your whole life can be summarized in that way. Just as then the result will be what is in Sutulasa, which is the next surah, in the insan of the Because of time, man was in loss. You lost focus of time. Why? Because of al-hakum al-takathur. So al-hakum al-takathur hatta zurtum al maqabir Until you reach the, until you visit the graves. Until you reach your graves. Kalla sawfa ta'alamun. When on the day of judgment, you don't have these worries. I need more, I need more, I need more. When finally on the day of judgment, that will not be there, then it'll hit you. What did I do? Where did I put my time? What did I do with my time? How was I so dis- You People will be so, dis- so amazed at themselves that what caused them to be so distracted from reality. كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Then you will come to know. Over there it's Tulqariya. I'm not going to go into the link with that. Over there the word is Adraq. Over here the word is Ilm. Al-Qariya thumma al-Qariya wa ma adraqa ma al-Qariya. Adraq is something different from Ilm. I will not go into this right now. الْحَاكُمُ التَّكَاثُرْ حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرْ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمًا يَقِينَ If you had only known with علم يقين that much knowledge is attainable not عين اليقين maybe even not حق اليقين but at least this much knowledge that you have ilm al yaqeen is attainable in this world. Very easily. Only if he had that much knowledge that he had ilm al yaqeen. You have never seen the North Pole. You've never been to the North Pole. You don't live in the North Pole, but you know the North Pole exists. You haven't seen the hereafter. You, don't, you haven't met Allah. You haven't seen the next light. You haven't seen the unseen. But you know ilm al yaqeen and you know, you know the next life exists. You know the life exists, the unseen exists. This much knowledge you can attain. And if this much knowledge you attain, it will be enough to motivate you in the correct direction. Ilm al yaqeen. Not ayn al yaqeen, which is next. Because obviously, on the day of judgment, even Abu Lahab or even Fir'aun cannot deny the reality that is happening before them. Inshallah, I will uh, continue in my next khutbah. Aqulu qawli hadha astaghfirullahi wa lakum wa li sahir muslimina wa muslimina. إن الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساءة من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعسهما فلا يضر إلا نفسا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجحيم ثم لترونها عين اليقين ثم لا تسألن يوم إذ عن النعيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي. So I was saying in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa taala says there are different levels of knowing. For example, we all know لا إله إلا الله. There's no divine and there's no authority other than Allah. 
We all know this. But some of us know it like I know the North Pole exists. I've never been to the North Pole, but I know it exists. Some people may not even know it at that level. Some people understand la ilaha illallah, so knowledge in terms of epistemology is not just how much you know, but the depth of which, in which you know it. This is something special in Quran which philosophy hasn't uh, tackled with. Epistemology generally has dealt with classification and forms of knowledge, but it has never dealt with the idea of how much of a realization of knowledge can a person attain. Quran deals with this issue. Anyway, this being put aside, Allah says, al takathur By the way, I wanted to also explain since I'm talking about knowledge. In Islam, please note what I'm about to say. I'm about to give you a very important legal point and a very important point in regards to Islamic jurisprudence. <coughs> Imam Ibn Khaldun, he wrote in his book, he summarizes Islamic classification of knowledge, just the general broad categorization. He said, Al-ilmu ilmal. Knowledge is of two types. Ilmu al-abdan or ilmu al-adyan. Knowledge of physical properties, physical things, abdan, badan, abdan. Knowledge of physical things, whether that is biology, physics, chemistry, so on and so forth. These are the physical things. Ilm al-ilm al-man, ilm al-abdan, wa ilm al-adyan, and knowledge of moral things, religious. You can say religious slash spiritual slash moral things. These are the two big classifications of knowledge. In this life, everyone has to know some level of the existence, the existence of cause and effect and the reality of ilm al-abdan. We, we all experience cause and effect and we know physical properties exist. But where we lose our, our sight is, is in, in the knowledge of the reality of things. The, real, the knowledge of morality of things. I just want to make one point here. Islamic law Sharia, Islam, is not concerned so much with ilm al-abdan. Let me give you an example. The Prophet وسلم, you know, in his time, they used to cross-pollinate the trees. And they would know when you cross-pollinate the trees, that more harvest comes from it. But they didn't do this out of knowledge. It's very important to understand that hadith. They did this out of superstition. It, they didn't have any knowledge that if you do this, then there is something called cross-pollination that takes place, and then, then you have more harvest. They didn't have that. They just knew it as a superstition. And so they would do it, but they wouldn't know what's happening. And the Prophet didn't like superstitions. Islam came to remove superstitions. And this is another thing that I want to mention, is that Islam was responsible for taking humanity out of superstitions into the world of observation. But now the world of observation has gone to the extreme of becoming completely materialistic. There's no, rea no, no reality other than the material things. This is what's happened to us. Islam wants to stay in the middle, not superstitious. Islam doesn't want superstition, but Islam doesn't want um, Islam doesn't want, you can say, materialism to the point that you're blind to any other form of knowledge. So, the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't like superstitions. And he saw them doing this cross-pollination out of a superstition. So, the Prophet ﷺ told them, do not do this. Do not do this. Do not do this cross-pollination. Because it was superstitious. So the next year, the harvest was less. Instead of being more, the harvest was less. So they came to the Prophet ﷺ complaining to the Prophet that you told us not to do this and the harvest is less. What did the Prophet say? 
You know your affairs of, and the word in one of the rawahs and amur al dunyakum. You know the affairs of your dunya more. The Prophet didn't, in essence, what, and this is actually a subject, I don't want to go into this. How do you know what the Prophet said as a Prophet? And how do you know what the Prophet said as Muhammad bin Abdullah? How do you make this distinction? If the Prophet is fighting with his wife, sallallahu alayhi wa do we say this is uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fighting with his wife is as Muhammad as the messenger of Allah? Or is this Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Muhammad bin Abdullah? How do you make this distinction? It's a very important distinction to be able to make. And in Islamic law, we have the rules to be able to do that. I'm not going into this. But just on this point, and then I'll come back to the main point that I was making, that, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for example, he was angry with his wife. And he said to her, because it was the idiom of the day, it was the way that people said things. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Aisha radiallahu anha, he said to her, may your hands be destroyed. So she started looking at her hands. When will my hands be? Because it's the Prophet of Allah saying this. He said to her, because he got upset, he said, may your hands be destroyed. She started looking at her, by the way, this hadith is in Bukhari, it's, uh, it has many wives. She started looking at her hands. When will my hands be destroyed? And the Prophet then started smiling because he knew what she was doing was just to, you know, kind of like make, make him happy, you can say. So there is a way, you know, there's also uh, another riwayah that I'll share with you because this is an interesting subject that I, I want to go back to my original subject today. There's another riwayah, for example, a companion of the Prophet who was a neighbor of the Prophet. So when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, many of the tabi'in, the people who had seen the companions of the Prophet, they would think, let's go to the neighbor of the Prophet. Who can tell you more about the Prophet than the neighbor of the Prophet? So they, they went to dinner with him, and they thought, we're going to ask him so many questions. So they started asking him, how did the Prophet do this? How did the Prophet do this? How did the Prophet do this? And he got this companion of the Prophet, he got angry. He said, Basically, to, basically, he said to them, I can't read the whole, he said, look, the Prophet said, not everything he said is part of Sharia, like you don't, not everything he says becomes part of Sharia. When he used to be with us, he used to laugh with us. When we had something good to say, he would have something, if there was something sad, he would talk in the same meaning, he would respond in the same way. Not all of that you have to take into account into how you have to behave. This is the saying of a companion of the Prophet. So how do you distinguish between, and not only that, another subject, uh, well I won't go into that right now actually because time is running out. Let me go back to my original subject because this is one day I'll see, you know, I wish we had more uh, hips selfishness, desire, greed for knowledge. And maybe this is actually a good time since I have everybody here. This would be actually a good time for me to mention a few things and then go back to the topic, which I'll wrap up very quickly. Number one, uh, I always I would like to encourage all of you to uh, go to the ISNA convention. Specifically, take your children there. It's very, very good uh, to be in a place where there's a lot of Muslims where your children, like, you know, to see 10,000 Muslims, 15,000 Muslims, 20,000 Muslims, for children that are growing up here in America, it is very rejuvenating, it is a very good thing, you know, to, to have that sense of bonding, that you're, you're part of something bigger than, uh, you're part of something bigger, and then of course, you know, so if you can, uh, the ISTA convention is here in Baltimore from the, um, on the, uh, on the 23rd. Memorial Day weekend. Okay, so if you can take your children, please do. It's a very, you know, even just going to the bazaar, seeing how many Islamic books there are, seeing products made by Muslims, seeing the products and things made in the Middle East that come from, and, and just meeting Muslims across the board of different backgrounds, uh, really from all across the nation, uh, is a good experience, especially for the children. And, uh, but anyway, please, if you can go, please do go. Okay, that's one thing I wanted to say. Second is, before I forget, uh, I want to have a Tajweed workshop on Friday, on the 22nd, not this week, uh, not next week, but the week after. So two weeks from now, a Tajweed workshop. I'm not gonna put anyone on the spot and say, oh, let me see how you say your fa. 
if you say it correct or not, or how you say your ha. I'm just going to do very basic tajweed because tajweed is a very interesting subject. In fact, I will point out to many of the miracles. Tajweed is an art that's actually a miracle because there's no other art form like tajweed. There's no other art form in the world like the art of tajweed recitation of the Quran. It is a uniquely prophet, a uniquely uh, a art of, of music that was given by the Prophet Sallallahu uniquely by him that was never adopted by anyone before him and has never been adapted at, except in Islamic things, anyone after him, you can say. So Tajweed has many miraculous aspects to it, uh, which I will go over that day. I'll just give you one example. Again, I, don't, I want to wrap up with the subject that I was talking about. For example, in Tajweed, and I'm not, I may or may not have time to go over these rules, but the heavy lam and the light lam. Okay. Whenever there's the heavy lam, which means that the letter before it has dhamma or a fatha, like alallahi, the meaning is also strong. Whenever there's a kasra, the lam after that is always like lillahi. So the meaning, the tajweed goes with the meaning of the ayah. It never happens that if you're reciting something heavy, for example, that the meaning is light. And it never happens if the, if the recitation is light, the meaning is heavy. It doesn't happen. So the Quran is made in such a... In fact, you know, there is exceptions. Like Bismillahi Majriha wa Mursaha. If anyone knows basic tajweed, this uh, Bismillahi maj, Majra. It should be Majraha, but we don't say it like that. We say it with the light ra in that place. <coughs> to go with the meaning. So tajweed is a very miraculous art. A, an art of recitation that has many miracles in it. That if you know a little bit of Arabic and you know a little bit of Tajweed, you'll be like, oh, the Tajweed helps me understand what the meaning of the ayah is, what the mood of the speaker, yani Allah, is, what is his mood, you can tell by the art of Tajweed. So I will be going over some of the basic Tajweed rules. I will definitely start with the, uh, the, the haruf, the letters, how to pronounce them, and uh, talk about some very interesting points in regards to that that uh, became known later.